if at some point, and I remember 10 years ago, I actually was asked to build primitives on the blockchain to have a fully Bitcoin-like, decentralized, not owned by anyone, a right? protocol to mutualize risks, and people decide to use it and to start pulling the risks using that, that's impossible to regulate because yeah. you cannot regulate an entity that does not exist as an entity and is a peer to peer network of people that you cannot identify. We have a fireside chat with Magda and Jess. Please come on stage, give them a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I sit here on the left because then the audience can see you guys more. Okay, no, I, I come. No, no, go, go there, go there in the middle. Thank you very much. All right, instead of an of a introduction, I would uh, I ask a very personal question, if that's okay. Did you, during the last uh, crypto hype, buy an NFT or a coin due to a TikTok video? Yes, no, and why? Not due to a TikTok video. And my blockchain journey started 10 years ago, and so I was very well aware of the value of NFT, so I mean, I started to bought them, and I sold them in the right time. <laughs> All right. Uh, and not, you know, the other way around. Yeah, um, and you are at Willis Tower Watson, so everybody out there here knows who you represent, in the case they don't know you, which is un very unlikely. How about you? Did you buy a coin or an NFT due to TikTok? No. As Magda said, I also did a lot of fundamental analysis, been in the space for the last six, seven years. So I bought at the right times, but I'm more so a Google's Indian side. And a whole bunch of, okay. at least the crypto assets. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, and by the way, you are from Uri. And of course, I, of course, bought a coin after seeing five TikToks. It's called Safe Moon. It's minus 99%. I'm so sorry. Yes, you know. But I did some other investments that are quite okay. So don't you need to be, we don't need to collect yet. Let's <laughs> see how if the safe moon restarts. Nevertheless, let's talk about uh, Metaverse and Web3. Big question. And I'm super happy that you guys are here and we are just among us. What the hell is that actually? And where can I buy it? Maybe you explain a little bit the both terms. Sure. So Web3 and Metaverse, we have to understand it within the context of what's existing right now. So the current web is called Web2. It's connected and it's housed on centralized servers connected using APIs. What Web3 is, you don't house it on servers, you house it on public blockchains. And instead of API, you can just query the data normally. So we have augmented reality, virtual reality. Virtual reality is like that. Headset and Aquil released an AR headset as well. What Metaverse does is, Metaverse connects that augmented reality or virtual reality with assets that you truly own. So in a centralized, I would say a centralized version of a Metaverse, you would not be owning the assets that you basically, let's say you play Call of Duty, you have a skin. That skin is residing within the Call of Duty service, but in a Metaverse equivalent of the king, you could own the NFT to the skin itself, to the gun, Tomorrow, if they change or they upgrade the game, you still house your collectibles. They have a value outside the game itself. So that's what the metaverse is. Jess, thank you very much for explaining that. It's the first time I really understood it. So thank you very much. Magda, I would never say this in public, of course. Magda, what, do you have to, what is your view on Web3 and metaverse? How, how do you define it? So I, I like to use an analogy when I explain it to people. And essentially, when you look at metaverse, you know, it doesn't need a decentralized infrastructure. As Jasa said, it could be on a centralized server. It could also be on a decentralized server. And it's really about that virtual reality, virtual land, virtual avatars, and, you know, a place where we interact with humans and businesses in, in the context of virtuality. And that could be augmented or it could be fully virtual. So that's the metaverse. And most of the experiments and the that we're seeing on the metaverse are actually centralized. Web3 is about something different. It is about understanding the value of decentralization as a decentralized infrastructure. And is, you know, the internet today is not decentralized. And what Web3 <coughs> wanted to do was to decentralize the internet and decentralize all of that connectivity. So to me, Web3 is a lot more about the ASO structure and that decentralized infrastructure enables a lot of additional economic values, one of which is the metaverse, but you know, there's many other layers enabled by Web3. We talk about different economic layers. Maybe you're surprised insurance comes to my mind. 
what kind of role can insurance play there or how could an application in this technology actually look like for insurance and what's DeFi, decentralized finance in, in that regard? Yes. What are your thoughts on that? So I'll answer that question in, in I would say two, two steps. So the first thing is, let me explain what decentralized finance means. And as Amanda said, it's better to do it in analogy when we're discussing with the non-crypto people because it helps give context. So like traditional finance, there are many contemporary applications that are available of similar financial structures like a bank or in the crypto space itself. So when you go to a bank, you deposit money, somebody else is borrowing the same pool of money, basically. In the DeFi space, we have something called a borrowing and lending protocol. What that does is you deposit asset one as collateral and then you can borrow asset two. And somebody else would have basically deposited that asset two. And it's completely peer-to-peer. -peer. Yeah. So what that means is the interest is flowing from one person to another or it's flowing between you, the pool, and then the second person. This DeFi is obviously revolutionary, but it comes with a problem. The problem is that because all transactions are immutable, if there's a fault in the code, which happens all the time, like programmers write code, which is, which is in the context of, you know, it can have bugs. And you cannot do the same thing in the DeFi world because if there's a problem in the contract and somebody exploits the contract, then that money is lost. So if we want DeFi to be true, truly yeah. revolutionary, we have to make sure that we can insure these smart contracts. That's where insurance comes into play. Yeah, and Magda, <clears throat> I heard especially two words, losing money. That's <laughs> not what we do in the insurance industry since a few hundred years. So I think we see a whole new chain of, I may change the wrong word, but a new category of risk arise, especially involving digital assets. How can insurers help here or can we actually help or are we obsolete? Yes, but before I go into yeah. the question, I'd like to come and answer in the sense of what do we see in the context of insurance and blockchain and the crypto, right? So when I started my blockchain insurance journey, it was almost 10 years ago to, to this day. And we had like this evolution of looking at blockchain to enable insurance in multiple ways, right? And first we looked at synchronization of data and, you know, to allow for things to avoid reconciliation and human error. And it was all about the efficiency and the automation and the ability to share data with distributed ledger technologies. And there's some good examples of how we made use of that, right? Do you think we needed a blockchain for that? Not necessarily, there's multiple other technologies that could have done that, but you know, back then, everyone wanted to use blockchain. And I even had a client saying, no, but just try to put blockchain into this because otherwise I don't get internal funding, right? And there's a little bit of the content, but... So essentially... Can you share a name? Just <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they have representation in the room. So essentially, you know, back then, 10 years ago, we trying to use blockchain for sales and was not, it wasn't for purpose. And at some point, it really became about, okay, can we look at this as a new way of generating data, as a new way of generating decentralized infrastructure in the context of these? And as an industry, where is not the decentralized insurance idea or that coded virtualization of risk that we are now seeing more in the DeFi space, right? And even in the context of blockchain native experiments around insurance, a lot of them went bust because yeah. they were trying to decentralize the wrong things and they were yeah. not ask the question of, hey, what does the technology do that I cannot do with other stuff? So today, I think we're in a context where there's two things going on. One, as an industry, we don't get to have the luxury of an excuse after 10 years of, oh, I don't understand this, so I'm not gonna insure it. And I feel really, you know, the blockchain space has been snubbed as an industry that no other industry in history in terms of providing risk capacity. Yeah. And we are the industry that are supposed to help other industries flourish and deliver innovation by transferring away risks. And, you know, I'm a believer. So for 10 years, I've been saying blockchain delivers social and sociological innovation. It enables a type of business model that nothing else enables. So we need as an industry to understand that so that we can transfer away the risk where it makes sense so that it can innovate. So that's one area, right? And that's the smart contract risk, it's cliff term risk, it's the certain risk we've been there, but it's many other risks that are generated by blockchain technology, including this is related to how society works and at some of which it could become, you know, systemic at some point. 
So essentially, that's one thing you need to do. The other thing is we can take inspiration. In commercial lines, we've been talking about computable contracts, consuming risk in different ways. So tokenization of risk is something yeah. that we seriously think about. And, you know, we don't need the blockchain to do that, but there's a lot of inspiration on tokenization and smart contracts that could help us digitize in the right way. But when we talk about tokenization of risks, isn't that actually a new word for risk pool? No, actually, because before pooling the risk, yeah. you need to fragment it, atomize it. The tokenization of risk is essentially, if you can tokenize an asset and we can have an apartment built in, you know, a tower built in Miami, which is owned by thousands of people across the globe because they bought, it's, you know, it's shared property yeah. because we tokenize the asset and then people bought it. Mm -hmm. So if we can tokenize assets, we need to be able to tokenize risks. Yeah, of course, if you buy, if you are able to insure a building with uh, with, uh, all, all, uh, with the building insurance or property insurance, you should actually also be able to insure a token which represents the building. Exactly, and you have to start tokenizing contracts. Yeah. That goes to subcontract, sub clause level, and then you atomize contracts. You are able to tokenize part of those contracts, and that enables secondary trading, algorithmic trading, the commoditization of things, ILS securitization of some of these tokenized risks, and that's you know go very far from that. But the way in which we digitize, we need to take that into account. The example of a building we tokenize and also tokenizing the risk and then covering this tokenized risk is, you know, taking the typical insurance product of a household insurance or a, a property insurance into the Web3 world. Are there completely new products possible? Or have you thought about some? Yes. So... I think many of the experiments have been wrong when utilizing risk, you know, and appear to be a fashion in the blockchain and some of these players are gone was because they were trying to do exactly that, right? So, well, do peer-to-peer home insurance, peer-to-peer pet insurance, peer-to-peer motor insurance, and, you know, they had no actual value for the customer because decentralization is a very difficult value to communicate, right? It's like Napster versus Spotify. You know, what you want is you know, be able to stream music. You don't care if it's decentralized, centralized, legally, being at the end of the day, the, the experience always trumps the rest. Yeah. So where blockchain is actually the living value is in things like microinsurance, not because we can automate parametric insurance. That's my, I hate that example. And every time two people talk to me about parametric insurance on the blockchain, it's like why you can do parametric without the blockchain. But because you can generate new data where there's none, right? And a lot of product development doesn't happen because we don't have historical data. And in the blockchain, you can use prediction markets. You can use things like, you know, we is doing in the sense of pulling the expertise of experts around certain things in a more efficient way. And, and therefore, the creation of data and the creation of pricing markets where there is no, no lost data is something that only the blockchain can do. And that usually is very much related with new risks, yeah. risks for new segments like, you know, the population in the south that is, that is growing that Chelsea was just referring to. Yes, a little bit. Is all of this the dream of the actuary or its death? I'm not sure yet, but probably something in between. But maybe Jess, uh, you can jump in me uh, because I'm sure you have an opinion on that too. Uh, Magda said also, It does not even need only to have a technology behind it, but it has to some have to have some value for the customer. So do you have some products in mind or topics in mind that really could not only excite the customer, but also the people in this room? There are novel risks on blockchain that I discussed, like borrowing lending protocols, exchanges, etc. And these novel risks are in desperate need of coverage, as Magda said, that we as the insurance industry have like failed to provide insurance capacity to these new novel risks that exist. That's why, you know, what I'm working on in Nuri, we basically work as a mutual and we're a decentralized autonomous organization where we do underwriting of the risk itself and also we raise capital on the chain itself. And the reason that we've had to do this is because nobody in the traditional side of the world was willing to accept or even understand smart contract lists. And I think we should start from there because that's where the maximum amount of value can be delivered and extracted from the blockchain itself for insurers. What I really liked about the idea about the lending protocol, it reminded me actually about the ledger, how insurance policies actually started some time ago. Okay, before we come, now we had fun, you know, not a serious part starts. And do you guys have questions? Don't hesitate to raise your hand in between at the end or put it into the sensational conference app you probably all have right now on your phone. Don't hesitate to ask questions. We will do it at the end. Okay, we talked about possibilities, about growth, about new risks, new policy, new products. Everybody is happy. 
And then there comes the CEO and says, heard, you heard about this risk and war and inflation. How about this stuff helping me cutting cost? Do you have some ideas for that? Sorry for ruining the good mood, by the way. No, I would like to, you know, death to say with the Mac. I really appreciate the environment with insurance this morning. And I do that in the context of the blockchain itself. So an example of where we're able to like cut a lot of cost is claims itself. So in, in the blockchain world, we have something called stablecoin. And a stablecoin is basically a token representation of a currency, usually in dollars. And it's supposed to stay at a dollar that's at. Sometimes there are new economic models which create stable ones out of thin and people demand insurance for that. So we had a product that's called US Terra Insurance as up and we did like underwriting and we had a cap on what the amount of USD we would actually cover. And when the stable coin defect, which means that instead of being one dollar of value, it I would say the value decreased below 90 cents, the claim was automatically triggered. And within 48 hours, everybody was made whole. There was no claim processing. People could just swap their USD for USDC, which is another type of claim coin, which is actually the wave at the dollar. So that's one of the ways we've been able to reduce cost. The other thing is, as Matta said, there's a lot of data that's available on the blockchain itself. We've built a lot of technology, and it, you know, I'm, I mean, so hide the fact that we still need a lot of human actuarial science mm. in order to evaluate risk. And this is something that Matt and I were discussing before the panel as well. The way Onori did it is we took cyber insurance actuaries and explained them blockchain because it's easier for people from the insurance industry to understand crypto rather than rather than the opposite. And this is not the view a lot of people hold. That was a compliment, was yes, it? Okay. It was a we are allowed to feel good now. <laughs> yes. So, so that's how, you know, we've been able to reduce cost, but I'm sure there are a lot of other ways maybe meant that we want to discuss yeah. more. Let me explain more my point about insurance. So essentially, hermetic insurance is about automating, you know, the payout of a based on some data. You have a very strong index and data providers, like in the context of blockchain, we're combining the oracle, so the, you know, the data generation of data is actually happening by a third party outside of a blockchain. And the automation itself can be done in the file, in your server, it doesn't need a blockchain to actually work. So when people were telling me we're doing this parametric part on the blockchain, you know, it was like, why? And you can do that in your server. In which cases does it make sense to do that like that? So when there is a lack of trust between the insurer and its customer, right? And there's a number of cases where that's true. I remember a product that was called, and that was from Salva Max in Mexico. It was about life insurance, and it was for migrants in the U.S. They wanted a micro life insurance to be automatically paid out to their families in Mexico. Probably would not even know that they died if they died. And they needed something that they knew was going to be automatically triggered. And therefore, it makes sense because the reason they were not buying life insurance was, among other things, lack of trust. So there it makes sense, right? But I feel in general, if you don't have a conflict of interest and a lack of trust, which is the case in most insurance markets, you do have those two components, then you don't really need insurance to automate anything. You can automate things and become more efficient without the blockchain. In the context of on protocols, that's different, right? Because the Oracle, the data and the protocol itself, they are on chain. So it makes sense that whoever is actually keeping that risk and ensuring it is on chain as well and it's decentralized. Yeah. But that's a very specific case. Using the blockchain to generate automation and efficiency and reduce costs to additional insurance should not make sense at all. All right. I would like to, to, to dig deeper into that because I have a funny feeling that, you know, the areas of companies with hundreds of thousands of employees doing manual tasks are going to its end. But we have some great questions from the audience, I heard. Do you want to uh, sh share some? Yeah, well, we've got some questions from the, from the app here. One is, how difficult is it to regulate crypto around blockchain? Why are the US and the EU not ready with rules and laws? Or is it actually a relevant question in times of decentralized things? Jess, what do you think? It's a, it's a difficult task to regulate crypto protocols. And human data law firm, we are the borderless protocol. And people who are capital depositors basically provide insurance. So you can, it's operates like a mutually. You can go provide candy on premium and you can also buy policy. We don't know who our customers are. We don't know where they reside. We don't have any KYC. 
So in this case scenario, like how would we even think about hacking it? So it's not an easy task, but because of the fact that there is a lot of efficiency in the way risk is priced in the insurance markets itself, we need to be able to get insurance policies, reinsurance policies within with the protocol itself. So that's something that you know we are still looking into. The other question was about US and the EU. I think EU is doing in land of crypto regulation. They infused MICA, which has a lot of regulations about stable coins, e-money tokens, how to be you know grow nascent blockchain protocols. The US, there's some political spectrum which I don't want to get into, but they will get into line one way or the other. They might be a little bit late to the party, but they have a lot of compounding effect of innovation, population, and development on their side. So whenever they do, do decide to go in the right direction, people will go back <laughs> to the U.S. singing Magda, your turn. Thanks, Rebecca. I'll be quick. I know we run on time. But essentially, there's two type of things about regulation. One has to do with, should I be regulating entities that are centralized and are delivering you know, risk transfer and insurance in the context of crypto or smart contracts or Web3 or blockchain? Certainly, if they're centralized, they can be regulated, they should be regulated. We have had conversations with people saying, yes, we saw some a couple of minutes in policy that, where do they say, oh, what a smart contract? And what is a smart contract doing with money? Oh, nothing, protecting it. I was like, have you ever heard of reserves? Have you, you know, if you want to behave like an insurance company, you need to have an actuality department and you need to have the right things in place because it goes to sustainability of the risk maturization. So that can be regulated and is being regulated. If at some point, and I remember 10 years ago, I actually was asked to build primitives on the blockchain to have fully Bitcoin-like, decentralized, not owned by anyone, right? protocol to mutualize risks, and people decide to use it and to start pulling the risks using that, that's impossible to regulate because yeah. you cannot regulate an entity that does not exist as an entity and is a peer-to-peer network of people that you cannot identify. Are we there yet? No. Do I think that we're going to get there in the next 10 years? No, because people that want to, you know, neutralize the risks don't see the peer-to-peer -peer space unless they're in this very, you know, niche place as the right way to go. They rather trust an insurer that has been doing this for one hundred years. Yeah. So I think that's where systemic risk and risk tokenization becomes very dystopic. Yeah. We're very far from that, and that's not we can't regulate that. No. We should regulate everything else. Yeah, and, and maybe there will be an Uber moment or a pandemic that catalyzes this customer behavior, we'll see. But I think we have a few minutes left, if I am correctly. Yeah or no? No, I would say let's take this uh, 30 seconds for a, raw, a, a round of applause for Jess and Magda. Thank you very much for this super interesting panel. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ten. Thank you. Thank you.